Amen. All right. The title of the sermon this morning is Warning Your Brethren. Warning Your Brethren. Now here in Ezekiel chapter number 3, we have the famous Watchman chapter. This is the chapter where Ezekiel the prophet is introduced to God's Word, where he is given God's Word as a, as a roll, of course, it comes to him, a scroll, if you will, and he eats it. And God commands, him, commands him and tells him to go forth and to preach God's Word. Now the message that Ezekiel is given to preach is not a positive message. It's, a, it's very much so a negative message. But his main job, if you were to describe Ezekiel's job, what you would call him is, as the Bible calls him a watchman, where you would say that he is going forth to warn his people. That is the job of Ezekiel here, to warn the nation of Israel, to warn God's people. I want you to look with me here at Ezekiel chapter number 3. Look please at verse number 15. It says this, <clears throat> Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv. That's like modern day Tel Aviv. It, you know, the B and the V, of course, go back and forth just like in Spanish. Uh, Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Kibar. And I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. Verse 16. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Now watch what he says next. Therefore hear the word at my mouth, <coughs> excuse me, and give them warning from me. So I want you to notice a couple of things that God says unto Ezekiel there. Number one, he says, I have made thee a watchman. Then he gives a job description unto Ezekiel. What he's going to be doing, of course, and that's warning. Now what is a watchman in the literal sense? A watchman, <coughs> if we use, excuse me, Michaela, will you give me some water, please? A watchman is uh, someone who, for a nation, would be set up in normally a high place on some sort of plateau, maybe uh, along the wall or a tower in the wall. They would be high above the people and they would be there at the entrance or the entry of the gate, right? So their job is to watch for invaders, to watch for danger. Their job is, when they see the enemy coming or any sort of danger, to warn the people. That is their job. That is what God is likening Ezekiel unto, right? A watchman, a physical watchman in that sense, a literal watchman in that sense, is meant to warn the people of that nation. Now God is saying, hey, I've made you a watchman. So he's likening his job unto the job of a watchman for a, a nation or unto a watchman for an army in a sense, right? And what are they supposed to do? When they see Danger. When they see an enemy approaching, when they see any sort of threat, what are they supposed to do? They need to communicate that message unto the people. They need to communicate that message unto everyone else so that they can respond. Now, if you don't warn them, they can't do anything about it, can they? If you don't alert them, right, they would have a trumpet, right, and they would blow their trumpet. <coughs> certain amount of, of, of blows would mean, hey, an enemy's coming, right? There would be a, a specific type of communication with this trumpet that would allow everyone else to understand the message and also to prepare themselves for battle, to prepare themselves so they could defend themselves. And that's what God is likening Ezekiel unto. He is a spiritual watchman. So what is his job? His job is to warn the people. And in what case, in, in, particularly here? They've fallen into great wickedness. They've fallen into great sin. And God has set Ezekiel up in a place where he is to go and to warn them about their sin and the coming punishment if they do not turn from their sin. This was a job that God himself gave to Ezekiel. Now, of course, Ezekiel was a very uh, a special person as far as the plan of God, right? He was given a job as an as a Old Testament prophet. There weren't, there weren't just, you know, uh, millions of Old Testament prophets. A lot of them God <coughs> came to and handpicked. God had a job for them, right? It was a very special job that God had for Ezekiel. Now, with that in mind, look at verse number 18. It goes into the message <coughs> and how God wants them to respond. And also his responsibilities. That's very important. It says this in verse 18. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die... And thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life. The same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood 
will I require at thine hand. So notice that God, <coughs> excuse me, Michaela, honey, go into my office and give me some of those uh, cough drops in the bottom drawer on the right side if you're sitting in my desk. <coughs> so, so God here is, is explaining unto uh, uh, Ezekiel, with your job, this is what comes with it. I'm going to have a message, right? And I want you to tell the wicked, you know, to turn from his wicked way. Now, if you don't go, go and tell him about this, you know, you're going to be in trouble. But also, he is going to receive a punishment as well. Look at verse number 19. It says this, Yet if thou, <coughs> excuse me, warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity. So notice, it doesn't relieve any responsibility on the part of the man who's living the wicked life. He's still punished, right? But then it says this, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So God comes to Ezekiel and he says, hey, this is a job that I have for you. He doesn't give him an option of whether or not, hey, can I opt out of this? You know, you know can, can I just choose not to take part in this particular job or can I just, you know, refuse this responsibility? No, he comes to him and he says, hey, this is your job. I want you to go and I want you to preach to the nation of Israel. I want you to preach to my people. When you go there, if I have a message for you and you don't preach it, and the man, because you didn't preach it, doesn't turn from his wicked way, yeah, I'll punish him. But guess what? I'm going to require his blood at your hand too. So now, since you didn't preach the message and you didn't go there to warn this man to turn from his wicked way, you're in trouble as well. You have your own responsibility to go and preach. So if Ezekiel would have just said, hey, I'm not going. Hey, I don't want this responsibility. What would have happened? their blood would have all, have been, all been upon Ezekiel's head. He would have been responsible for the blood of all these wicked people that may have had the opportunity or would have had the opportunity and may have turned from their wicked way, may have turned from their sin. Look at verse number 20. <clears throat> Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, <coughs> he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin and his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered, but his blood will I require at thine hand. Something that you can learn from this as well is that even when someone's doing that which is right, you still need to give them the warning. Just because you may be on the right path today, that doesn't mean anything. You still need to hear the same preaching. You still need to be warned that, hey, what you're doing today, what, the life that you're living today, you turn from that life and start getting into sin, you'll be punished too, my friend. Don't just, you know, don't just uh, uh, want to hear preaching about uh, new things, maybe all these other areas in your life that, that you struggle with. You also, need to be, you also need to hear preaching about maybe the areas of your life where you have these things right. You know, that's important as well. You need to be warned that if you do turn from doing what's right, even if you're doing it today, you could be punished. <clears throat> it says in verse 21, Nevertheless, if thou wert warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, <coughs> and he doth not sin, he shall surely live, because he is warned. And then it says this, Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. So look at the strong responsibility that Ezekiel has. Where God goes so far to say that thou hast delivered thy soul. Now this is not, of course, spiritual salvation, talking about going to heaven or hell. The Bible oftentimes say, hey, this many souls traveled into this city. It's just another way to speak to the core of the person. It's to talk about the value or the importance of the person when the Bible uses the word soul oftentimes. Um, uh, there, of course, there's value in each individual, and that's what, why it will use that wording. So notice how he says that, though, thou hast delivered thy soul. So he has this responsibility, and if he doesn't do it, he's going to be punished by God. All of their blood is going to be upon his head. But if he does do it, notice what it says. You have delivered your soul. You have delivered thy soul. You know what we see is? The importance of the watchman. The importance of the watchman. The title again of the sermon this morning is Warning Your Brethren. Warning Your Brethren. Now, a lot of people don't like to hear the watchman, do they? A lot of people don't like to hear the preaching of the watchman. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13. Many times when the watchman stands up to warn those of, of, the, imp, of the impending danger, of the, <coughs> in, the, the incoming attack, 
It's inconvenient, isn't it? Maybe they're in the middle of their life. Maybe they're living their life with their children. They're enjoying their life with their family, right? And the watchman stands up and he blows the trumpet. Hey, there's an attack. That's inconvenient, isn't it? Because you have to alter your lifestyle. You have to change your lifestyle. In that case, they would have to prepare themselves to, to defend themselves against this attack, right? Well, same thing goes for the spiritual watchman. Oftentimes, people are inconvenienced by the watchman's message, aren't they? Oftentimes, when the watchman stands up, he's standing up and he's pre preaching a message that is not convenient for you. It's not going to be convenient for you because you're going to have to alter your lifestyle. You're going to have to change things in your own life. And what will happen is many people will become annoyed by the watchman. Many people will become bothered by the watchman. Many people will maybe even resent the watchman and they'll look down upon the watchman. But the watchman is watching for your soul. That's what you need to keep in mind. The purpose of the watchman is to look out for your soul. It's to look out for your well-being. It's to let you know, hey, you need to turn from your wicked way or you're going to be punished. You're going to die in your sin like it talked about in the book of Ezekiel. I want you to look here at Hebrews chapter number 13. <coughs> this is the responsibility of the pastor. He is a type of watchman. Ezekiel was a prophet of Israel, so he was a watchman over the nation of Israel. He had a very special job. In the New Testament... There's a watchman over each individual church. And hey, that person, whoever that man is, whoever that pastor is, his job is to look out for the sheep. His job is to look out for those that attend the church. His job is to warn you. And you shouldn't resent the watchman. You shouldn't get annoyed with the watchman. You should take heed to the warning and understand that, hey, he's watching out for your soul. He's trying to deliver your soul. That's the point of the watchman. He cares about you. Look at Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number 17. It says this, Obey them that have the rule over you <coughs> and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls <coughs> as they that must give account that they may do it with joy <coughs> Excuse me, and not with grief. For that is unprofitable for you. Now, this is a very powerful verse when, it, when it's speaking, of course, of about, about, about a pastor. There's so much that we can learn from it. Number one, I don't think this bothers anyone here, but it bothers a lot of people that it tells you your pastor, he's referred to many times as the ruler, and it tells you this <coughs> here in verse number 17. Excuse my cough, this came about just right before the service. Obey them that have the rule over you. So there is an obedience to the pastor. He is the ruler of the church. Now, if that bothers you, your heart's not right. Because I'm not the one saying it, God's the one that says it. That's why they're referred to as the ruler. That's why they're called the bishop. That's what the word bishop means. The Bible says to obey them that have the rule over you. And why? For they watch for your souls. What's the job of the person that's the ruler? To watch for your souls. I have a responsibility of this church. I have a responsibility to make sure that no sin creeps in. I have a responsibility to make sure that everyone is protected here and that there aren't you know, people coming in with malicious intent. That is my job. That is my responsibility and I am set up. Once you meet the qualifications and you take on willingly and voluntarily the job of a pastor, you become the watchman over those sheep. And you have a responsibility for those members of that church. Notice what it says after that. So it tells you, of course, for they watch for your souls. And it says this, <coughs> as they that, <coughs> excuse me, as they that must give account. Doesn't that sound familiar? It's identical to the job of Ezekiel. What did he say? Hey, if you don't warn them, I'm going to require their blood at your hand. If there's a pastor of a church that does not preach a particular doctrine that warns his sheep, that warns the members of his church, and that person falls into that sin, you didn't give them warning. Yes, they're going to die in their sin, but I'm going to require their blood at your hand, pastor. I'm going to require their blood at your hand, bishop. That's the job of a pastor, is to watch for the souls of those that attend the church, to watch for all of the sheep. That is his job. Now, <coughs> look at what it says next that they may do it with joy and not with grief. Do you know what that means? <coughs> if you disobey the pastor, if you are constantly you know, uh, not listening to maybe the commands or the orders that the pastor gives, that it's going to make my job uh, you know, unjoyful, if you will. I don't even know if unjoyful is a word, but not joyful, right? It's going to make my job not joyful. It's going to make my job, it says this, <coughs> uh, um, it's going to make my job full of grief. 
Because it says that he may do it, that they may do it with joy and not with grief. So if there's a ruler that knows his job, he knows what he's supposed to be doing, and he is warning the people, but he's just having problems with the people not listening to him, he's, his job is not going to be joyful. His job is going to be filled or full of grief. And then it goes on to, <coughs> to say this, excuse me, for that is unprofitable for you. So of course, if the ruler <coughs> is bothered or <coughs> irritated, excuse me, goodness, if he's bothered or irritated or if the relationship between the ruler and all of the people is not going very well because they're not listening, we're not having any problems in the church, guys. Just, you know, you can calm down. But uh, if, if maybe he's getting irritated or he's getting bothered or, or and, and, and people in the church are, are just disobedient and every time he turns around, he's got to keep saying like, hey, I've told you five times, I don't want it done this way. I don't want this happening, right? This is not what I want. He's going to be doing his job you know, and, and it's not going to be joyful. He's going to be doing his job and he's going to be doing it with grief. With, and it's going to be bothersome. But even on top of that, it says it's not profitable for you because he's the ruler. So it's not going to be a fun relationship and he's the boss. So you're the one that loses out in the end. That's what this is saying. You're the one that actually is going to lose out in the end of this dealing because the ruler obviously is the one that makes the rules and the ruler is obviously the one that enforces the rules so he's going to win. He's going to say this is how it's going to be done and then it's just going to cause problems, right? But here's the point. The job of the pastor is to be the watchman, to watch for their souls. You should look at the pastor and thank him and love him for warning you. When the pastor warns you, you should thank him. You should have the right attitude. I want you to turn to Acts chapter number 20. <coughs> Verse number 31. Acts chapter number 20, verse number 31. <coughs> Paul, of course, was an apostle. He was given a special responsibility as well. You have the prophets of the Old Testament. You have the apostles of the New Testament. Of course, you have uh, New Testament pastors as well. But as far as special responsibilities, we had the prophets of the Old Testament. We had the apostles of the New Testament, right? And their job was to be a watchman in a, in a, in a more vast sense, in a greater sense, right? Over a, a, a mass, a masser responsibility. And not just over a single congregation or anything of that sort. So notice how Paul treated his job. It says, let's back up to 28. <coughs> Acts 21, or 20, I'm sorry, Acts 20, verse 28, it says this. Take heed therefore unto yourselves... And to all the flock. So he's speaking unto pastors. Over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers. That's like a, a ruler, right? <clears throat> That's where we get our, our, our word supervisor. Like a seer, visor, vision. And super means a head. Over, super. A supervisor, overseer. It's the same word. To feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Notice this person is watching over them. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise. <coughs> so not only will there be people that will creep in as just church members, but there will also even be pastors who will come in that are false prophets. It says, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. <coughs> then he says this in verse 31 to the pastors. <coughs> Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So notice the job of the apostle, and he's actually giving this advice unto the pastor. So this is the same thing the pastor should be doing. They need to be watching, number one, that's a watchman. And what should they be doing when they watch? They need to be warning the people. Look at verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. So notice the care and the love that He has for the people that He's watching over. No, look at the, verse of, the end of verse 31. When He talks about watching and warning, He says that I cease not to warn everyone <coughs> night and day with tears. So is this warning, it, the warning that He's sending forth, is it a warning of hate? No, of course not. Was the warning that Ezekiel was, was uh, sending forth or preaching, the message that he was is echoing forth, was it, a, was it a warning of hate? No, of course not. He was warning them with tears, it says, night and day. So he had compassion on those that he was warning. He cared about those that he was warning. The whole reason why he was warning them in the first place was for their own good. 
So there are different types of watchmen. This is a, the apostle. We can see the pastor. Go to 1 Peter chapter number 5. We'll see again. talks about the pastor. 1 Peter chapter number 5. So we can see as far as God's character, He wants there to be watchmen over groups of people. He wants there to be watchmen over <coughs> different situations or scenarios. The church, the nation of Israel. We see this, that He sets up people and their job is to warn others. He sets up people and their job is to give a warning because you, sh you should care about those people. You should love those people and you want to warn them about a sin. Maybe a sin that they're not in yet that they could get into. Maybe a sin that they are in and they need to turn from it. Oftentimes the watchman can become a nuisance to people if your heart's not right. A watchman can become, you know, uh, uh, you know uh, irritating. I've heard that a hundred times, right? Whoever it may be. This doesn't only have to be the pastor, but any sort of preacher, right? Maybe if an evangelist came in and preached, you know, the modern day evangelist, and you heard one of them preach. Maybe if you went and listened to some preacher anywhere, right? It doesn't have to be your personal pastor at the church that you attend, but whoever the watchman is that's standing up and he's warning you. Sometimes it can be annoying, but hey, keep in mind they are watching for your souls. They're looking out for your soul. They care about you is the reason why they're standing up and preaching that message in the first place. Again, look at 1 Peter, as I said, chapter number 5. Look at verse number 1. <clears throat> The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear... Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now you notice there again in verse number 2, he tells them to feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof. This is the exact same thing we saw in Acts chapter 20. He told those uh, pastors specifically to feed the flock. And then he talked about them being overseers. You know, one of the main ways that the pastor is an overseer and that is warning them, standing up and watching them and warning them is by feeding the flock. It's by God's word. How did Ezekiel warn those? He preached the word of God. Now I'm going to get into what is really the meat of the sermon. I want you to turn to James chapter number 5 verse number 19. It's not necessarily about the pastor this morning watching. It's not necessarily about the pastor warning his brethren. It's not about me standing up here and warning you. The majority of people realize that that's my job. The majority of Christians that go to church, they realize that the whole purpose of the pastor's there is to warn me and to preach to me about sin, that maybe I'm in or maybe I could get in, that I need to get out of my life, right? I'm going to be talking about warning your brethren in general this morning. I'm going to be talking about the importance of the responsibility from one Christian to another. So I have a responsibility that I was entrusted with when I was ordained as a pastor. This responsibility of course comes with the job of the pastor. It's a part of the job description of a pastor and if you choose to take on this job you are receiving responsibility for, for a flock, for the sheep at the church. So those that would be interested in maybe pastoring in the future, that's what you're taking on that you are taking on the job of watching for their souls. And God will require their blood at your hands. God will require... It says that you will have to give an account thereof in, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, where we read. You will have to give an account for what took place in your church. I want you to think about that. Whatever happens in your church, if you want to be a pastor, that's your job. And God will make you answer for that one day if you don't do a good job. God will punish you and their blood will be required at your hand. Yeah, they're, they'll be punished too because they made the decision and they got into sin. There's no excuse for that. But you taking on this job, hey, it's, it, it, it comes with the territory. It comes with the responsibility of the pastor. But not only that, Christians have a, have a responsibility, an inherent responsibility as a Christian to warn their brethren. There is a responsibility that is given to each individual Christian to warn others. Now it's obviously not on the same level as a pastor. It's not on the same level as an overseer. Nevertheless, there is a responsibility to each individual Christian. There are different responsibilities that we inherit when we are saved. One of them is that he gave to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's your job. Amen. That is your job. The Bible says in, uh, I believe it's 1 Thessalonians 4, that we're not called unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. You know, another thing is, 
that we are called to live a holy life. That's one of the things. When you are saved, you have responsibility now as a child of God to live a holy life. That you have different responsibilities that are given to you when, you're, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you trust in Him. There are just these inherent responsibilities. And another one that people may not think about all the time is warning their brethren. Being a watchman unto their brethren. Now, as I said <coughs> before I go into this, it's obviously not on the same level as a pastor. Your job is not to go over and to, to, to try to oversee every area of your brother's and sister's life. My job's not to do that either. My job is to oversee the church and the workings of the church as far as the congregation where we meet here, our, our assembly, right? But we all have, on an individual level as Christians, the responsibility for each brother and sister in Christ to warn them if we see them in sin. To go and to tell them, hey, you know, I love you. You need to get out of this sin. Very similar unto Ezekiel's job and very, very similar unto a pastor's job. Now, I had you turn to James, correct? Go to the book of James, chapter number 5, if you're not there already. James, chapter number 5. <clears throat> I want you to see this in verse number 19. <coughs> verse number 19, it says this, the very end of James 5. Brethren, so who is he speaking to? All of the church, right? Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And then it says this, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Now I want you to notice that this is being addressed unto all of the brothers and sisters at this church, isn't it? The word brethren, man, is normally talking about mankind, everyone. So the women are of course included in this as well. But it says, brethren, he's speaking to all those at the assembly, speaking to all of the church, and he says, brethren, if any do err from the truth, and one convert him, it says, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death. And it says, and shall hide a multitude of sins. Notice the responsibility of the Christian there. What is it? If someone errs from the truth, what is your job? Your job is to convert them. Your job is to go and convert them. Why? Because it could be that you're saving a soul from death. Isn't this identical to Ezekiel's job? That was his job. He saw the, uh, the nation of Israel were living in sin. Obviously, God came to him previous to that because God, God knew and said, Hey, they're in wickedness. I have a job for you. You need to warn them. And what could the result be of him warning them? They could turn from their sin and do what? They would turn from their sin and they would save their soul from death. They wouldn't die in their sins, right? So we see the responsibility here of the Christian to warn other brothers. To go to and warn a brother if you see him falling into sin. I want you to go now to, uh, go to Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. 1 Thessalonians 5.14 says this. He's writing unto the church, of course, in Thessalonica. Now we exhort you, brethren... Warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. I want you to notice what that said. Now we exhort you, brethren, all the church, warn them that are unruly. <coughs> There's a job given to every brother and sister in Christ to warn their brethren. Here we see an example of someone to warn them that are unruly. If you maybe see someone that is just disobedient in general, that's disobedient to God's rules, that's maybe disobedient in God's house, maybe disobedient in any way of their life, you know, uh, and, and, and I'll get into specifics later, but if you see them being disobedient, what does this imply? You need to warn them that are what? Unruly. That, aren't, that, are, that are defying the ruler. Whether it be, you know, let's say in this case, God, maybe even the pastor. Just a ruler in general. Some sort of ruler. They're being unruly. That's what that means. You need to warn them. That's all the brethren, right? <coughs> Look at Galatians chapter number 6. Galatians chapter number 6. Now, this may be a responsibility you don't want. Ezekiel might not have wanted his responsibility, but tough apples. This is a responsibility of Christians. God doesn't ask you about this. It's kind of like this, hey, I don't want to go soul winning. Too bad. God gave the, already gave you the ministry of reconciliation. Amen. You have certain jobs to do as a Christian. And if you don't do those jobs, it doesn't relieve you of the responsibility. It just makes you disobedient. That's what it does. Right. It doesn't just delinquish or relinquish the responsibility to someone else. That's not what happens. You just become disobedient. You're just going to have to be, you're just going to have to face God and give an account of all the blood that's on your hands. That's what you're going to have to do. 
If you see a brother that errs from the truth and you don't warn him and you don't go to him and bring him back into the truth or at least try, God's going to require his blood at your hand. You're going to be responsible for that as well. You're supposed to warn your brethren. Warn them that are unruly. Amen. Look at Galatians chapter number 6. Notice again the commandment unto brethren to warn their brethren, to bring their brethren, their brethren back to the truth, back to the church, back to the way of God or the rules and commandments of the Lord, whatever that may be, <clears throat> whatever area of life. Look at Galatians 6.1, it says this, Brethren, that's all the church, if a man be overtaken in a fault, watch this, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. First, I'll touch on the, <coughs> the warning there <laughs> unto you also. If a person is in sin, you need to not, you know, uh, put yourself in a vulnerable situation to, to, while you would be pulling them out of sin and making yourself possibly fall into sin also. So that's what this is saying. You need to consider yourself. If you need, if, if there's a brother or a sister that's fallen into sin, you don't get into sin in order to get them out. You don't put yourself in a, in a situation where you may be tempted, right? If this is maybe, if, if a brother falls into a, you know, sin and, he, you, and you walk by and you see him in a bar, you know, you don't go in there and sit down at the bar, right? Especially, if, you know, obviously, in any case. But if you were to think about this and apply it to all other areas of, of different sins you'd have, especially you wouldn't put yourself in a situation where you're already tempted with this type of stuff. But it would be wrong in the first place. You're supposed to uh, abstain from the very appearance of evil. You shouldn't go in there and sit down with him and talk it through for a couple of hours while you're at the bar and you're like, hey, you know, uh, I'll take some, uh, you know, some fried pickles while I talk to my friend here. Obviously, that's wrong, right? I love fried pickles. Pickles, so you may not like them, but I like them. So here's the thing. You don't you need to consider yourself when you do these types of things. You need to consider yourself when you're trying to pull another brother uh, uh, back to the way of the truth. But notice what it says. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault. So if there's another brother that errs from the truth, just like James said, right? If there's an, a brother that we have here at church or a brother that you know. Right? That, that you know is born again, he's a Christian, and he's overtaken in a fall. Maybe he falls back into sin of his past. Maybe he falls into a new sin. You know what you need to do? Ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. It's your job to restore him. It's your job to go to him and say, hey, you know, what you're doing is not right. You need to come back. You need to come back to the fold. You need to come back to serving God. You need to come back to the way of the truth, right? They err from the truth. That's your job. This is not an option. You know, we're not going to look at every command in the Bible and say it's, if this is optional or good advice. This is an imperative statement. That's what it, this, is, this is a command unto you, my friend. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in a spirit of meekness. That's your job. As a Christian, ye which are spiritual, Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. And then considering yourselves, of course. But you know, so we need to keep in mind also when we're restoring such an one, we need to do it in the spirit of meekness. We need to do it in the spirit of humility. We need to care about the person. How did Paul do it? How did Paul say that he stood there and warned them? He said he did it with tears, right? Now, you could say, oh, well, <clears throat> you know, because people today, they have these weird ideas about no one likes what they would consider hard preaching anymore, Paul preached extremely hard. Right. Paul, you know, Paul talks about, hey, you want me to come, come to you with the rod? You know, but how did Paul say that he warned everyone? Obviously, it's not a literal rod. He's saying, I'm going to come there and I'm going to verbally bring a rod with me is what he's saying, right? What is he saying? He's saying he's, he's going to do it. He said he did it in, with tears, didn't he? But his heart is right as far as he's having compassion and meekness. Sometimes the message, you think everybody loved what Ezekiel was preaching? Go back and read the words of the watchman in the book of Ezekiel and tell me how he sounded. He stood up and he called their sin what God called their sin. He stood up and he called out the wickedness that they were doing and the sinful life that they were living in. And I'm sure a lot of people didn't like hearing it. But you know what? He was doing it in the spirit of meekness. He was preaching the word of God and it was for them. They watch for your souls. Now, if a person wanted to you know, uh, uh, not listen to it, that's their business. That's their job. But at least he, he, the blood is free from his hands. Amen. Right? At least he's doing what he's commanded to do. Right? So you need to make sure that your heart's right. If you see a brother 
stray away. The reason that you should be going to them is because you care about them, because you love them. You should go to them, even, you know, if it's a serious situation, go to them with tears. If it's a serious situation, I mean, you should, be, you should be compassionate and merciful in the first place. You should restore such in one in the spirit of meekness. What is meekness? It's humility. It's humility. And especially, notice how he says it. He says, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. Excuse me. He says, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. You know what that means? You could, probably, you could possibly fall into this sin. It's possible you could even fall into this sin. That's why you should be meek. Because we're all sinful creatures, aren't we? That's why you should be meek or humble. Because we all could fall into sin. You know, the things that he did, it's possible for you to do that also. You know, the Bible talks about, Therefore let him that thinketh he stand, if take heed, lest he fall. Right? That's a perfect application of that. You could, all, you could be that person that falls into sin. You know, God forbid, but it's possible is the point. Then it goes on, verse number 2, it says this. <coughs> Bear ye one another's burdens... And so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, if you compare Scripture to Scripture, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to focus on this, but what this is referring to is loving your neighbor, loving your brethren. You know, the law of Christ is oftentimes talking about loving your brethren or loving your neighbor. If you look up like Romans, I believe it's uh, 14. There, you can see this spoken of a few different times. Actually, in Galatians 5, it's spoken of as well, too, just the previous chapter. Let's talk about loving your neighbor, loving your brethren. It's loving for you to watch for your brethren. It's loving for you to look out and look over your brethren. It's loving for you to care for your brethren and to go to them and to tell them, hey, you've erred from the truth. You're in sin. You have this fault and you need to fix it. Now, oftentimes, the watchman can be annoying, just like the pastor can be irritating. The pastor can be annoying. The things that the pastor says, if it offends you, it can annoy you. It can bother you. As can it you... Also, if you go to another brother, if you go to another sister, if you go and tell her or him, hey, you have this sin in your life, and I've noticed it, and I love you, and I want you to fix it. You know what they can do sometimes? You're, you know, yeah, Mrs. Righteous, get out of my face. Mr. Righteous, get out of my face. But you still need to warn them that, hey, at least the blood's off your hands. But you need to go to them not, you know, sometimes people can kind of have, have an attitude that they just want to correct everybody to kind of lift themselves up. So that's not the attitude you should have. You should actually be going to them, not to try to make yourself look good, but you should be going to them with compassion. You should be going to them in tears. You should be going to them in the spirit of meekness. That's the spirit you should have, humility. Amen. That's what you should have. Maybe, maybe if it's a very personal problem, it's a big issue, go to them and explain to them, hey, I have my own fault. Divulge to them maybe a little bit of information, not specifics or details, but hey, I have my, this, 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 this sin that I struggle with too. You know, but I try my hardest to keep it in check. You know, so I understand what it can be like falling into sin like this. But you know what? You're erring from the truth in a major way. You need to get your heart right with God. You need to do this. You need to do that. So I'm giving advice to you to go and help them. But also, I want to give advice to the person, if, if it's you, maybe that falls away. Don't hate the watchman. He, you know why he's doing it? Because he's watching for your soul. Do you know why Ezekiel was preaching? He was watching for their soul. Do you know why pastors preach God's word and the warnings and all of that? They're watching for their soul. Do you know why this Christian is going to this other Christian? They love you and they're watching for your soul. They care about you. They have compassion on you. And they want you to come back to the truth. They want you to come back to God's way. To the church, whatever it may be. They want you to come back <coughs> to walking in the spirit and living a spirit-filled life of serving God, right? We need to care for our brothers and sisters in Christ. So many times, all these, all these churches all across America, you'll have, they'll only have 70, 80 people in the church. Somebody will stop coming to church and nobody makes a peep. Nobody even reaches out to the person. Nobody even finds out, hey, where are they at? They don't even notice that they're gone for months and months and months. What a wicked, wicked spirit. That's wicked. That is evil. You need to love your brethren. Reach out to them. See where they are. See what's going on. Care about them. Right? Treat them like a family member. Can you imagine if one of your family members weren't there? Can you imagine if one morning you wake up and one of your kids are missing? Can you imagine waking up and your wife's not there? You should love your family here just the same. You should love your church family just the same. You should love your brothers and sisters in Christ in the same exact way. If one of them's not here, there's something wrong. Reach out to them. Find out what's going on. If somebody doesn't come <coughs> to service for a couple of weeks, <coughs> excuse me, reach out to them. Right? Care about them. If you see them in sin, warn them. 
Don't resent the person when they come to you. Receive the correction if you're wrong. Have you know, the, the spirit of meekness yourself. Right? <coughs> says in verse 3, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. And then it says in verse number 5, For every man shall bear his own burden. I want you to turn now with me to... Uh, <clears throat> I want you to go to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter number 4, verse number 9. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 4, 14 says this, I write not these things to shame you, but as my beloved sons, I warn you. Now there he's talking about in context, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 4, of course, that chapter is about how uh, you will receive reproach, you will be mocked and ridiculed for the cause of Christ. But oftentimes, even from another angle, you know, people will... People will bristle because they feel like they're being looked down upon if you're warning them. They'll feel, like, they'll feel shameful. They'll feel you know, like, they're, like, like you're just uh, de uh, you know, degrading them when you're coming to them and warning them. You know what you should do? You should appreciate the person that cares for you. The reason why they came to you in the first place is because they love you and they're looking out for you. So you need to not bristle if someone comes to you, even if they're wrong. Let's say someone accidentally comes to you. And they come to you in the spirit of meekness, and they're like, hey, what's going on, man? I saw this, and, and you know, I, we just need to, I just, I'm here to help you. I want to make sure you get this right. If they're wrong and it's a misunderstanding, don't be angry. Why are they there? Hey, we're all human. We're wrong sometimes. Just explain to them, hey, you know, this is what's going on. You actually misunderstood what that meant or what I was doing or whatever. Whatever it may be, things happen in life, right? Don't be, don't be angry with them. They're watching for your souls. They care for you. They love you, right? Notice the, the commandment in Galatians 6, though. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. You know what that means? That's your command. That's the law of Christ. Look out for one another. That is a commandment that's given to you. That's the law of Christ. You know what it said right before that? Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Then he goes on and says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's not an option, my friend. You as a Christian, you have a responsibility, and it is the law of Christ to love your neighbor. And you know what a part of that is? To look out for him. And if he's overtaken in a fault, it's your job to go to him and to bring him back to the fold. To bring him back, like it says in, uh, in James 5, to the way of the truth. It says if one errs from the truth. Bring it back to the way of the truth, right? To God's word, to living a, a holy life. Where did I have you turn again? E uh, Ecclesiastes, actually. I read 1 Corinthians 4. Go to Ecclesiastes with me. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. Right after the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4. You'll see this spoken of again. <coughs> where one brother is, is looking out for another brother. A Christian is looking out for another Christian. Ecclesiastes chapter number 4 verse number 9. It says this. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Verse 10. Look what it says next. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12. <coughs> And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, of course, this is poetic, and this has uh, very deep meanings, right? And it's talking about the importance of banding together. It's talking about the importance of having, you know, uh, close friends or having brethren. And one of the, one of the, the uh, um, benefits of having other brothers that are close to you is the fact that if one falls, what's the other one's job? He can help him back up. Right? Exactly what we saw in Galatians chapter 6. I want you to turn now with me to Leviticus 19. Sometimes the sin maybe that a brother falls into is a serious sin. Sometimes, uh, you know, uh, a brother may be com committing something that is, that is grievous. It's not just a small sin. It might be something large. It might be something that's very harmful to his family. It might be something very harmful to himself. <clears throat> and, it, and he doesn't just deserve a small correction. He needs a, a very stern, uh, uh, strong correction. The Bible talks about uh, the, uh, a, rebu a rebuke. Excuse me. There's reproves or reproofs 
and there is rebukes. And rebuke is a very sharp correction, a very strong correction. The Bible talks about, you know, it will, it will refer to things uh, um, that would be small corrections for one brother correcting. And there's stories about this where one brother goes to and corrects another brother. You know, uh, in a very light-hearted way, in a very, um, you know, uh, 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 a smaller type of correction, uh, a, a weaker correction, right? Because it's meant to be. This is a smaller transgression, whatever it may be, right? But sometimes your brother or your neighbor might commit a grievous sin, right? We may have someone here that commits a grievous sin at one point, something very, very bad. The Bible commands you as their neighbor. The Bible commands you in order to fulfill the law of Christ, loving your neighbor, loving your brother, you should rebuke them. That is a part of the watchman's job. It would be to strongly correct your brother. <clears throat> look at uh, Leviticus 19, as I said. I want you to look at verse number 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Thou shalt in any wise, that means in any way, Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor, and then it says this, and not suffer sin upon him. Do you know what suffer means? It means to allow. You know what you're doing? You know what that means? That you would be doing if you didn't rebuke him? You would be allowing sin upon him. You would just be letting or allowing sin to be upon your brother or sin to be upon your neighbor. Brother and neighbor are used interchangeable. Actually, even in this chapter, you can see that. If you keep reading before and after. Look at verse... Uh, uh, well, in that verse itself, it says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. Right? So notice brother and neighbor, they're used interchangeable. Right? It's, it's a couple other times in this chapter too. I remembered it was this chapter. I couldn't remember where it was actually the verse we were in. But it says, Thou shalt not hate thy brother. And then it goes on. <clears throat> in thine heart, I'm sorry. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. So number one, we can see that if you don't rebuke him and you see your brother or your neighbor in sin, you're allowing him to sin. You're letting him. Notice the responsibility. That's a responsibility. This is a command. Thou shalt. Thou shalt. This is a command to all Christians, Amen. let alone a pastor standing up and rebuking the congregation or reproving the congregation or just repro reproving an imaginary possibility of a sin, you know, just preaching the Word of God, reprove, rebuke. That's a part of the pastor's job, right? But this is also a responsibility for individual Christians, for each brother and sister in Christ, that if they see another brother, <laughs> excuse me, or they see a sister, you know what they need to do? If it's a grievous sin, if it's a major sin, if it's a sin, that, you know, that, especially if it's an open sin, them that sin, rebuke before all. It talks about uh, that, that are open sins, the Bible will refer to that, in front of the whole congregation. Things that are major sins, that person needs to be rebuked, and it's your responsibility if you know about it. It's your responsibility and your job as a brother and sister in Christ to do that for them. And you know, what you're, well, you know what you're doing if you don't do that? You're hating them, according to this verse. You're hating them. Our world today, so many people that are even Christians are so confused and they have a backwards philosophy that's not even, it's not even close to what the Bible teaches as far as the philosophy. And it's the same type of areas of like, or same type of, of, of thinking as it is in the area of discipline. If you spank your children, what does the world say? You hate them. You know what you're doing? You're correcting them because why? You love them. That's what the Bible teaches. So the world's like, oh my gosh, you're beating your child. You hate your child. The only person that would hit their child is someone that hates their child. No, the only person that wouldn't hit their child as far as spank their child is someone who hates their child. That's what the Bible teaches, my friend. If you're not spanking your child, you hate your son. You hate your daughter. If you're not spanking them, when they do something wrong, you know what you're doing? You're suffering sin upon them. That's what you're doing. You're allowing them to, to, to develop these bad habits and they will grow up and they're going to be a bad person. That's what it is. You're not doing something good for them. You're doing something bad for them. That's what you're doing for your children. Now, on that same note, it's the exact same philosophy. It's the world's philosophy. It's not a biblical philosophy. If you correct someone, do you know what oftentimes people will say? You're so hateful. You hate them. That's retarded. Right. That's ridiculous. That's not biblical. If you are pointing out a problem that someone has, you're loving them. Amen. A neighbor or brother. You're loving them. You care for them. If you are rebuking your neighbor and he's in sin, you know what I'm doing? I'm not suffering sin upon him, my friend. Right. 
I'm being a watchman for my brother. I'm being a watchman for my sister. I'm pointing out these sins that they have that could get worse and worse and worse. And even if it's a, it's, if it's a very grievous sin, like in the case of Ezekiel, hey, he could die in his sin. You know what you're doing? You're just allowing your brother to destroy himself. You're allowing your sister to destroy themselves. Maybe they're even destroying their family life too. <clears throat> and you're not pointing it out. You hate your neighbor. You don't love your neighbor. Don't tell me you love your brothers and sisters in Christ if you're keeping your mouth shut when they're in sin. You hate them. That's what you do. That's how you're living your life as a hateful Christian. That's a hateful Christian. Think about that. People would point, up, point at us and maybe preaching that I've preached and they'd say, that is a hateful Christian, wouldn't they? No, you're a hateful Christian if you're not pointing out sin in your neighbor's life. You're a hateful Christian. You, don't, you know why I'm doing this? Because I love you. You know why I would go to a brother or sister if I saw them in a serious sin? Because I love them. Because I care about them. That's true love according to the Bible. I don't care what the world thinks. I don't care about their philosophy. They're a bunch of idiots. That's the wisdom of fools is what that is. The wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. That's what that is. That's foolishness. It doesn't even make sense. The Bible always makes sense in all cases. You are loving your child when you spank your child because you're showing them love. It's an act of love because I'm doing this because I want you to get better. It's just the same reason why God would, would scourge us. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Does God hate you? No. Who he loves, he chastens and scourges. Why? That's why he gives the, 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 the instruction later in that same exact, exact chapter in Hebrews 12. So that which is turned out of the way, that it can be turned back, right? So you can get on the right path again. Someone errs from the truth. He wants to bring you back to the way of the truth, doesn't he? But God also wants Christians to go out there. And to bring neighbors back to the truth. Bring brothers back to the truth. If you see a brother in a sin, you need to go to him and you need to let him know. If it's a major sin, maybe he deserves a rebuke. Obviously, that's on your own discernment. That's something you need to take very seriously. But I'll, I'll you know, give a bit of advice right here. As you, if you're going to go to someone with a rebuke and, you, and, and, it's, a, and, and it's a major sin, you need to be 100% sure that they're in this sin beforehand. And you need to use great discernment in the first place of the way that you approach the situation. You need to think about it. You need to, you need to be very diligent about it and take it very serious. And obviously you need to not go outside of your bounds. We're all sinners and of course we may all have you know, small faults, right? I'm talking about real sin in your life that's, that's, that's hurting them, that's causing damage. Real sin. You don't just go and point out every fault that your brother has, right? You know, after service, I'm just like going around from person to person. Hey, I need to talk to you for a minute. Hey, Brother Anthony, come here real quick. You know, you got this thing in your life, or whoever it may be, just one. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about having sin in your life, right? An open sin that's bad, that's damaging, that's hurtful. They've erred from the truth. Now, you look at it, you use that phrase, and then tell, and then in your mind, you need to be able to tell whether, hey, has this person erred from the truth, right? A lot of the Bible is up to your discernment, right? When God gives you commandments and stuff, you need to, that's why you need to read the book and you'll grow the mind of Christ, right? You'll grow into the mind of Christ and you'll understand. Uh, you'll have a fuller understanding of, of how to, to react in situations and things like that. Uh, base it upon the wisdom of the Bible, right? <coughs> Go to Proverbs chapter number 27, verse number 5. <coughs> We're just about finished. Go to Proverbs chapter number 27, verse number 5. <coughs> Proverbs, the book of Proverbs, and this is specifically Proverb, chapter number 27, verse number 5. The Bible says in Luke 17, 3, Take heed to yourselves. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. Of course, I preached a sermon about uh, forgiveness and how in order to truly forgive someone, that person has to ask for forgiveness. They have to repent. They have to come to you and, and ask for forgiveness, right? Well, here in uh, Luke chapter number 17, verse number 3, it's talking about specifically if they you know, trespass against you personally, if someone sins against you yourself, right? It's, it is biblical for you to go to them and rebuke them. You need to go to them if they sin against you, they actually sin against you. Look in the Bible, different things, ways people can sin against someone else, and if they've done that to you, then you need to go to them and they need, you need to rebuke them, right? This is biblical. It's not only for yourself to reestablish this relationship, right? Because in order for someone to move on if they've been done wrong, they need to air it out. They need to let it out, right? They need to go to that person and say, hey, this is wrong. You shouldn't have done this to me. I need, you know, 
You, you know, you need to ask me for forgiveness. That's how it works as I, I preach that sermon, right? Biblically. So it's your job in that case to go and rebuke them. In that, in that situation, for the relationship, but also even as we saw before, overall as brethren, ye which are spiritual, restore such in one in the spirit of meekness. <clears throat> So you're in Proverb 27. Look at verse number 5. It says this, Open rebuke is better than secret love. This is, the, this is the true philosophy of the Bible when it comes to love and hatred. It comes to rebuke. An open rebuke is better than secret love. You know what that's saying? That if you loved someone on the inside, right? You really had the love in your heart for the person. And they're in sin. They're living a life of sin. The best thing for you to do is to go to them and openly rebuke them. That's better than having love secretly and not showing the love. So you know what? how you show the love? The open rebuke. That's what that's saying. The open rebuke is better than secret love. And op it's saying that the open rebuke is love. That's what it's saying. Open rebuke is better than secret love. You could even, you could even interpret it this way. If a person went to someone and didn't even love them, right? Let's say... Brother Elliot hated Brother Anthony. Brother Russell, because it's his brother, he loves Anthony, right? Brother Anthony erred from the truth. Brother Elliot, who hates Brother Anthony, goes to Anthony and he's like, hey, he doesn't even like you, but he's like, you, you are wicked. What you have done is super sinful. You need to get right with God. You hear that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> brother, brother Russell's like, I love him so much, but I'm just so afraid, right? To go to him and to tell him. He just terrifies me, right? And he doesn't go to him and tell him that. Brother Elliot showed love more than Brother Russell. That's what that means, really. That's what that's saying. And when I look at that, Brother Elliot loves him more. You know why? Because he went to him and he pulled him back. And let's say that, you know, hey, Brother Elliot, whether he, you know, he's obviously got his own sin in his own life here of hating him and his brother in his heart. But you know what? Brother Elliot is showing love. An open rebuke is better than secret love. That's what that's saying. What he did was better than what he did. He may have great love for him, but he's not showing it. You know what the Bible says? What we just read in Leviticus 19? It says you're not supposed to hate your brother in your heart, but thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. He, he's hating him. He may love him in his heart, but he's showing hatred towards him. You may love your children in your heart. You may have a great love for your children, but if you're not spanking your children, if you're not correcting or disciplining your children... You're doing an act of hate towards them. You're hating your child. You're showing hatred towards your children. Because you're not correcting them when they need it. Well, your brothers and sisters, when they're in sin, they need correction. Man. They need to be corrected. Man, it looks ominous out there, doesn't it? Goodness sakes, like that. Goodness. Yeah, but so, so in order to show love to your brethren, in order to truly love your brethren, love in sincerity and in truth, you need to rebuke them. Amen. You need to rebuke them if it, if it, if it calls for that, right? I want you to turn with me to uh, 1 Peter <laughs> chapter 4, verse 8. We're going to end there. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter number 4, verse number 8. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you from Proverbs 10, 12. It says this, Hatred stirreth up strifes, but love covereth all sins. <clears throat> First Peter chapter number 4, verse number 8 says this, And above all things have fervent charity <coughs> excuse me, among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. <clears throat> charity in order to sh it is, is very similar unto love. Charity is very similar unto love. You notice in the Old Testament when this is found, it says love. It's in the New Testament, it's what? It's charity, right? It's almost the exact same phrase. It's almost the exact same statement. Actually, and obviously we don't need to know this. We believe the King James Bible is perfect. But in the New Testament, the, word, the same word that's translated as charity is the word that's translated elsewhere as love. It's the same exact word. But when the word charity is translated, it's always in regards to loving and doing work. For someone, actually showing your love through a work or doing something along the, the, those lines, oftentimes in the New Testament, when you see it being translated as charity. Like 1 Corinthians 13, you read through there, it's oftentimes talking about showing something, right? Charity, it says, 
is the greatest thing it says in 1 Corinthians 13. And it tells you here, it gives you a command, it says, And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. When a brother or sister is in sin, in order to, to help them cover that sin, right? In order to, to help them get right with God. It says in, I'm going to read this to you, stay there. James 5.20, where we started. Let him that know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. You know that's a similar statement right there? Do you know what that person's being? He's being charitable. Or he's loving his neighbor. You know how he did it? He went to him and converted him. You know what he had to do? He had to warn him. He had to tell him, hey, you're in sin. What you're doing is wrong. The life that you're living is sinful. You've, you've erred from the truth. That's not hating him, that's loving him. And that's your responsibility, Christian. The sermon's not about the pastor warning you. That's not what it's about. The sermon's about you and your responsibility. And it's a commandment and it's the law of Christ. And you know what it is? Love your neighbor. Do you know a part of loving your neighbor is rebuking your neighbor when he needs it? It's correcting, maybe reproving your neighbor. Just take him aside. Hey, I've been noticing that you have this problem or you've been doing this. And I love you. And I'm, that's why I'm coming to you and I want to help you get this right. Amen. And whatever you need, I'll help you do it. You need me to do this, I'll do it for you. You need to be willing to sacrifice things if you truly care for your brother, right? right. You need to bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. <coughs> that man in James 5 is covering a multitude of sins. You know why? Because he's charitable. What did it say in the Old Testament? He loved him. He used the word love. We see it in the New Testament, it's charity. True love, true charity, in certain situations, is actually going to them and rebuking them. It's actually correcting them, right? Now, when we close the services, I don't want each person going up to each person, right? And I know that's not going to happen. But it is, I do want to end with this. You need to have discernment before you approach your brother. Really. Because you may be wrong. You may approach him in the wrong way. And you may develop or you may uh, create a rift in your relationship going forward. Also, if you end up being the person that's in sin, you need to receive the correction. Amen. You need to have meekness. You need to have humility. So, number one, have discernment before you approach your brethren. Be diligent before you approach him or her. Number two, you need to do it in compassion and meekness if you're the one going forward. Why? Because you love them. That's the reason why. It's charity. It's love. That's how you're covering their sins. That's how you're saving a soul from death, right? You need to care about them. That should be the reason why they're going to them. Number, and then also, on top of that, in the same regards, in the flip side, if you actually are the person that's being approached, keep in mind they're doing this because they love you. Because they're, they're showing charity to you right now when they come to you. So you know what you need to do? You need to receive it in meekness. You need to receive the reproof or the rebuke. That's what you need to do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for <clears throat> the watch.